So kicking things off, we have Dr. Miguel Roman of Leidos and Manuel, I'm going to try to get this, Irarazabal? Irarazabal. Irarazabal. Con acento. Of Bank of America. Enjoy. Ah, thank you. Thank you. you. You said it better than most people say it in Chile, so <laughs> that's good. Uh, so thank you very much for the, for the, for the kind introduction, and thank you very much, Dr. Roman, for, for taking the time and, and being here with us. I think it's super exciting um, to have this discussion. Uh, myself, I, I, I've spent a lot of time in my career, all of my career, on the energy sector. Yeah, I do energy banking now. Uh, but I worked in a utility, so I've, I've spent a lot of time in this, and, and I'm an environmental engineer by training, so I, I have a lot of connection with what we're going to be discussing today. Um, so I'm very excited to, to start this uh, discussion. Just on logistics, we're going to have a 20-minute a, a discussion here, then we're going to open for 10 minutes of questions, so start thinking about your questions. I don't want to have to pull questions out of people. Um, and there's also, I think, an online channel so people can ask questions online. So let's get started. Starting on a more kind of personal question, right? I mean, you studied engineering in, in, in Puerto Rico. You have 30 year experience in uh, education in Cornell, Boston University, IBM, NASA. It, it, it's, it's super remarkable, kind of the path of your career. Um, and when I think of kind of, I started as an engineer as well, right? And, and a lot of us engineers, we end up going to kind of the dark side and we go to finance or, or, <laughs> or, 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 or companies. Did you always start, I mean, did you always think that you would end here or, or you would be doing this? Or, or was, was this a moment, were there a moment like they said, oh, this is what I want to do, right? Yeah. I I was fortunate enough to be a part of, of, of a large community of, of, um, of Puerto Rican, big Catholic family that I have <laughs> where we had a lot of opportunities to um, go around uh, our environment and do all sorts of things, you know, fish and swim and go to the Junque rainforest. And I was out of the 21 cousins that would go into these excursions every weekend. I was probably at least one of the top two most curious kids in the whole Colon family, right? Roman Colon family. And, and I think being a scientist, at the end of the day, there's, there's two qualities that, that define you. Know, one of them is you're a very curious person, and you're seeking to uncover new things about the world in which you live, right? And so there's a lot of parallels with that across some professionals, you know, like journalists. Journalists want to cover the truth of, of what happens to our society. And throughout my career, I have evolved from being a curious and seeking discovery to actually figuring out how, how to fix things, you know, at the very fundamental level and at the system you know, level. What to do about it, yes. right? Yes, and I remember I've had Every, every scientist throughout the Greece, they, it's, they're lucky if they have at least one, made one major discovery. And mine was, back when I was at NASA, I, I actually helped build this satellite uh, known as the Suomi National Portal Orbiting Partnership, and I launched this satellite in 2012. And one of the qualities of the satellite is that it has night vision. You can see city lights at night. And so I was, I was in charge of calibrating this instrument, making sure it was working. And as part of that, you need to go to many different places around the world and look at the data for very long periods of time. And I decide, because I'm the manager, so I decide that the test site should be Puerto Rico. <laughs> <laughs> and we were monitoring the stability of lights coming from cities, coming from cars, and everything should be pretty constant because lights are out there all the time. And I found out that lights during, between the December and January timeframe were going up by up to 40, up to 70%. So I was the first scientist ever to use a satellite to measure Christmas lights in Puerto Rico from space. <laughs> Pretty cool. Yeah. So I was, I was, and so I went back to NASA and I was like, why are you, so first of all, you don't get paid to measure Christmas lights from space. <laughs> you need to hustle your manager. 
to say why I'm babysitting a satellite, can I get 10% of my time to discover what we can do with this data, right? Because it's the public who gets access to free data from NASA to do scientific discovery. That's our contribution, not just to our nation, but to the world. And, but I'll tell you, the other discovery that I made using the same satellite, using the same setting, Puerto Rico, uh, after Hurricane Maria struck Puerto Rico, we measured um, the first ever images showing the extent of power outages in Puerto Rico, um, the longest power outage in Puerto Rico, in, in the United States history. And so I went from being in the cover of the Washington Post, uh, something that acted, again, the policy of our public <laughs> affairs office yeah. at the time, because they didn't want to show that, and to going from being a discoverer to being an advocate on behalf of underserved communities in Puerto Rico. Wow. No, that's amazing, remarkable, huh? It's, a, it's amazing how many people can say that they launch a satellite, right? I mean, very, very few. Huh? So you're a scientist, a, a numbers guy, right? That, that you, you understand more than any of us kind of what the information can bring on, cli on climate change and kind of inter interpret it. On the other hand, you're also an engineer, right? And being a NASA, you're a rocket scientist. So, um, so you, you understand the potential of the, of the technology. W when you speak with your kids, I mean, we were talking about your kids before, I mean, how do you explain the whole climate issue matter, right, and, 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 and kind of how, where the world is going and what can be done, right? I like to talk about the issue of sustaining life on Earth in hopefully meaningful and thoughtful ways to all sorts of people, including my kids. And I, I like to impart on them the fact that, you know, living in this planet is like having a bank account with a credit card account. Like, you really have very limited resources. You need to sustain life on Earth, all of life, the biosphere, the trees, our vegetation that allows us to have a supply food chain, everything, right? And I, I like to tell my kids, like, look, right now, if you open the refrigerator, we're consuming the equivalent of 160% of all resources. And we need to try to get that down to less than 100% in order for the biosphere to sustain humanity life on it. And so that's the challenge of climate change. We are overcharging the Earth at a level of that it's almost equivalent to, we're consuming two Earths and humanity is going to accelerate in the way we build new cities, particularly across uh, under the, you know, the global south, both South America and Africa, and that's the challenge. And so I, I'm hoping that people understand there's just sort of an accounting of like, you know, I don't like when people say that we are experiencing an era of like unlimited everything. Like, no, yeah. it's like, it is you know, limited. It is <laughs> limited. And we have a way to understand productivity of nature. And a lot of what I do as a climate scientist working at Lattice is to make that connection with technology and society. And, and so, I mean, I, the analogy of the consumption is, is super helpful. Now, you can tell your kids to consume less, or we can kind of find technologies to either help consume less and do more with less, or, or to kind of fix some effects, right? Are, are you an optimist on technology, do you think? I know that a lot of people are afraid of saying they're, I'm, an, I'm a techno-optimist because then we're gonna kind of lose the sight on, on, on the less consumption. But, but it seems that we need a solution on both sides, right? I look at technology as a catalyst to help. I, I think I am an optimist. I think technology is the spear that will help us, you know, the, the tip of the spear for climate change action. I think, I think there is a need for us, however, to focus on efficiency and redundancy in the way we try to tackle the problem. A lot of the times, many different countries, particularly rich countries, they only try to do efficiency. They, they look at um, emissions, they try to look at ways to uh, create sustainable cities, um, but when a category five hurricanes crosses through your lands, so you get punched in the face, and then you need to start over. So you, you, you have to invest in redundancy, uh, making sure that you're building infrastructure that builds to last. 
I mean, look at this place. Our forefathers built this place for us to last. And, and so sometimes I think we need, we need to uh, know where the investments need to be um, because these shocks are gonna become a commonplace. They're gonna become more, our climate change is gonna become more recurrent. Uh, there's gonna be more frequent uh, and more acute events that we're gonna have to face. That's a good segue. I mean, the, 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 the way that a lot of developing or, or the world is kind of looking at this uh, issue of emissions, right? Um, when, when we were talking before the, 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 when we were preparing the presentations, right, you said something interesting that, that kind of sharing climate data makes our markets more stable and not less, right? And we have very unstable markets for the last uh, weeks, at least the ones that here that are in finance will, will know what I'm talking about. Um, and, and we see on the other hand, governments and countries working towards net zero, right? Saying, okay, the, the, the solution is to reduce the emissions, right? And a lot of the developed economies are pushing in that way. And, and for example, banks, we are setting targets for net zero. So we, were, we will not bank people who emit, right? So we're being kind of policy police on, the, on, on these issues. I, I, have a, I have a dilemma here because LATAM and, uh, and emerging markets in general uh, are developing on, on intense emitting industries or extracting industries, right? And they have to produce emissions to, to continue developing. So how do you balance um, in a world where we have the S, right, the social aspects of, our, of, our, of, of some regions of the world that need to develop, but we also want to do it in a way that is clean. Yeah, right? and I tell you, in science, the dilemma is also the same because we look at projecting how the world's going to look like. And in 2100, there's, um, there's going to be 50 times more urban areas than we have today. And we want uh, places like West Africa to thrive and to not have the lock-in in emissions that we have by building infrastructure that's not sustainable. And, and so I do think that from a social dimension point of view, we need to make sure that Latin America is given the power to make these decisions and that these communities have power to make those decisions. It's an issue of governance um, and accountability. Uh, we should not allow uh, outside entities to ensure that, these, that, that Latin American governments and at the, at the community level are just informal, inactive partners that are acting upon. And so that means that we need to be um, creative in the way we think about the future of Latin America. I think besides the political trouble, and again, talking to someone who was born in a U.S. territory, I can go and go on and on on this, but energy independence, food security, water sustenance are things that we can do, and we don't need to have a centralized system of response and inefficiency to act. We can do that now. We, there's no need for the people, people of Puerto Rico to go through a drought. There's our efficiencies in the water chain in Puerto Rico where 80% of the water is wasted. 20% of electricity is wasted in, old, in the old way of doing centralized electrification with transmission lines that are just wasting. We had this report um, just a few weeks ago. In Mexico, extraction of fuels happens off the Gulf of Mexico. There's just this one leak that accounts for 3% of all carbon emissions, one leak. And so, again, we go to the issue of efficiency and accountability and being able to put all those pieces together. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, when there's this concept, right, of leapfrogging, right, that, that we talked about this earlier, right, where, where a lot of our emerging market countries could benefit from what's being investigated in the developed market, and you can you can start off much more efficiently. Yes, right? and the opportunities for growth, particularly in places like in the financial sector and microloans, are massive in allowing us to leapfrog and ensure that we uh, can achieve equity for women and and for underserved communities. Um, Africa did not have to install landlines. They went straight from cell phones into digital. Yeah. That's one example. Um, and 
I think the, there are opportunities that if, if done uh, with a way towards ensuring a, a, a green future for underserved communities and not make the simple assumption that as we're making our cities more sustainable that we're achieving gains in sustainability. That is just simply scientifically not true. We, we've got to figure out a way to make sure that our communities are not being pushed away from cities where there are more access to services and amenities, which is something that even our nation faces right now. Yeah, and I, 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 I find it super interesting that, uh, I mean, having people within the organizations that have this view it also gives a different perspective, right? So you can help from within an organization and say, yeah, this is a good solution, but think of what's happening socially, right? I mean, and I think that's, yeah. a, that's a function for everyone here, right? And when they're, we're in, in our organizations. So I, I, I wanted to, to, to kind of switch a little. I, this, this is, I could speak about this all, all, all evening, but I mean, you work with very impressive technologies at, at, at NASA, right? And, uh, and in, in your career, um, and you've seen the international cooperation on technology. Um, how do you see, and I think it goes a little with what we were talking before, how, how do you see that international cooperation going forward, is it, is it better? And, and, and how do you see science within Latin America? Are, are you seeing interesting developments happening? I mean, it, I know it's hard to impress you, but, but what are you seeing in terms of the development internationally and the cooperation, and, but also particularly in Latin America? I'm seeing um, scientists, particularly younger generation scientists, being able to crowdsource and build community and capacity in ways that I, when I was a young uh, scientist, did not see that and had to learn the hard way about uh, sort of the, the gatekeeping that happens, for instance, in academia, where you're trying to publish, you're trying to um, um, make a name for yourself by, by winning grants. Um, there's this amazing group called Geo Latinas, Geo Latinas, which is Latinas in Earth and Planetary Sciences. They have over a thousand, uh, 11,000 followers on Twitter. And it's a, that's, there's my plug, by the way. Um, amazing group, no one sponsors them. You know, no, like there's no science agency. It just was created out of a need for a gap to, to protect the careers and advance the careers of Latinas who had to weather the effects of COVID and publish and ex be expected to be carrying the same performance as males who are basically publishing three times more during COVID and being asked to be on an equitable setting as them, themselves. So I think there, there's hope. Um, I also think of Puerto Rico and the many local governance activities happening like places like Casa Pueblo in Adjuntas, uh, a team that uh, has shown the possibilities of scaling renewables in a way that sustains, you know, um, um, and allows people to survive in the face of climate change. Being able to have access to basic services uh, to ensure the re refrigeration of your insulin um, and responding to so, the unforgivable acts of government deception that happened after Hurricane Maria and say, we're not going to pathologize that. We're gonna take care of ourselves. We're not going to assess any trauma as part of our community resilience practices, but we're gonna ensure that the infrastructure is there for our community. Oh, thank you. So finally, in, in the room we have a gathering of, uh, of a number of, of Latino alumni from, from the most prestigious universities and, and working in, involved in organizations that have real impact in a, in this community, um, I mean, would you give them like a, a final message? What, what, what would you like them to keep in their head when they go back and into into their circles and influence? Right? I mean, what would be your message? I would message say, there? I know there's probably a few folks here doing data and climate, and they understand where I may be coming from. Um, and I'm just very lucky to be now as a part, I mean, you think I'm in the dark side, but I'm having a great <laughs> time at Lidus because I'm learning of the fact that there is an ability to scale where you're at a certain level. Um, I always thought I had to hustle for research money 
And now I know, I just found out that Google, Intel, they're, they're our supplier. They're coming to us with like, I want you to help me work with the federal government. I was like, couldn't believe it. And, but I think part of, again, going into how climate is part now of our business practice. Think of the fact that while we may not be passing policies and regulations around climate practices right now at an accelerated pace, and it may look like it's politically impossible, just wait. Just wait until something like Maria happens, hopefully, unfortunately not happens to any of your colleagues, but just wait how you will feel that's gonna be politically inevitable. And so I'm hoping that that is going to, uh, that we don't have to go through something like that, another Katrina for us. Unfortunately, that's human nature. You have to wait and seize those opportunities and we need to make sure that our Hispanic community we're, we're united because there are oftentimes bad actors that try to uh, exploit those opportunities to, um, you, know, cap, you know, and capital uh, on the top of human suffering. And if we, we as a community ensure that our communities are protected and the resources are going to the right, in the right direction, I think we, we're gonna thrive uh, uh, as a community and we're gonna be able to um, help advance um, you know, Latinos both here uh, in our nation and across the whole world. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much for, for, for that conversation, Miguel, and it was super interesting. I could spend the rest of the evening here. No, but let, let's open up to questions. I mean, if, if you have, there's a mic there someplace. Thank you for your work. There. I'm Rodrigo Sierra. I'm with the American Medical Association, fellow Borinqueño, so thank you for that too. Um, at the American Medical Association, just last week, a thousand doctors came together at our House of Delegates meeting, and among other things, they passed policy declaring climate change a public health threat, which I hope was helpful to the cause at some, at some level. I, w I wonder, and I say that to proceed this question about, um, you know, there's been an attack on science um, that goes back, that probably started with climate change, but then throughout COVID became something about not believing in a pandemic that's killed a million people and not believing in a vaccine that's been tested in millions of people. How do you think about that in your work mm -hmm. and what can we do when we go back to our companies and our communities about pushing back on that narrative yes. um, and helping people get more involved? Uh, two things that we can do. Um, I serve in the National Academy of Sciences panels on sustainability, and we just recently convened a Nobel Prize Summit on, on efforts to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. And as I was talking to the executive director for our next summit, uh, the most important topic that science right now wants to address is disinformation. Uh, we have a serious problem. It's not just affecting. Um, capacity and knowledge of basic principles in climate, in climate, but also politics and identity um, and nationalism. So these are things that we need to attack um, and provide the latest of what we can do in terms of everything from digital harvesting of, to prevent it from happening. Um, at the corporate level, we need to, um, we, 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 we have a sustainability working group at Lidos that puts a lot of attention in, in educating our own employees about the basics of climate science. I sometimes hear, because of the disinformation, trusted colleagues who I, who I work with that say, what do you talk about when, when people say that plants are gonna love climate change because there's gonna be more CO2? It's like, okay, man, look, okay, sit down. Um, the temperature's gonna go up evapotranspiration is going to go down, photosynthesis, you know, the thing that you learn in biology in third grade is going to go down. Therefore, food security is going to go down. There's just, and that's not even including population growth. So you need to put that in the same way we have to take training for export control and like IT, we need a climate informed corporate entities. Our 43,000 employees are, are now going to be uh, climate intelligent. We need to be weather ready. You know, how, how many lives do we lose in this country for basic things about, you know, flood and flash flooding? And it's just basic things that could really not just save lives, but also be integrated as part of all our sectors. At Lighthouse, we have the health, we have technology, we have defense, all these things touch the climate practice. So I'm, I'm sitting at the top and trying to find these solutions. 
Next question. Hi, my name is Dr. Aurora. Doctor, thank you for your work from one doctor to another. Um, I just wanted to um, have you create some insight for us as to how we build a pipeline to STEM. Um, and um, I guess it's twofold, and also in terms of leadership, building the pipeline for women leaders in this particular space, which seem to be grossly underrepresented? Um, I think I, I look at, I, ha I have been um, blessed by opportunities to be mentored across my entire career, ever since I was in, in, in public school in Puerto Rico, and there were always opportunities with federal agencies to create the pipeline, and I've seen I've seen that pipeline sort of disappear in a way. Um, there were opportunities for minority serving institutions to obtain graduate assistantships and fellowships, and that took me all the way through Cornell and, 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 and to NASA directly. I didn't have to do a postdoc to, to go and work as a civil servant. Um, I do want to concentrate, I mean, this is a very complex topic because you can start with early childhood education and the thing, but I will, I will talk about the issue of equity and gender in academia as one that I think we have to be paying a lot of attention. Um, I know of a colleague that just joined the faculty at Clemson University, well, I, sh I shouldn't have said <laughs> that, at a major R1 institution, and had served as a distinguished member of the School of Ecology and, and Science in Puerto Rico for eight years, and was not allowed to obtain tenure, count that against her tenure package. So we put these artificial gatekeeping walls that prevent Latinas in academia, of which like they're already unicorns, like if you find one, that's like that, and, and you're preventing them to interacting with our communities in Latin America, a bet accredited communities that have the same accreditation as all the universities that are represented by the summit. So I'll tell you what I do. I now am part of, uh, you know, Fortune 500 company that has strategic university alliances. And I pay close attention of those, what alliances I make to ensure that there's equity in the process of how you treat our Hispanic faculty. And so that's, you, you don't know, sometimes you don't know the power that you have and you have to use it. And so you have to question the provost and say, what happened here? Is that gonna happen? Because what does that mean? I have 2,000, we have, in our LIDOS, have 2,000 uh, job openings funded. And so we recruit and we throw money at SUIs, at strategic universities. And so we have a lot of power in changing uh, the same pipeline for the better for our communities, and we have to use it. So maybe we have time for one quick last question. Dr. Roman. Uh, I'm actually bringing one from the online audience for you. Uh, first it says, congratulations, Miguel, on a terrific career. Your service at NASA and your continuing contributions to the climate debate. By the way, we have Puerto Rico and NASA in common in our backgrounds. This is Michael Montelongo. With respect to the climate, I'm concerned that the hyperbolic end of the world must get it done now commentary by some loud voices preempts the opportunity to engage in civil discourse and consider reasonable energy policies to transition and adjust our national energy mix and profile that incorporates the limits of current technology and the cost of new technology breakthroughs. What are your thoughts on this matter? It is my responsibility as a scientist, as a father, and as an individual to inform you about with some degree of uncertainty about what will happen to our planet in years to come. And in, for many societies, it's something in a faraway place, it may be something, climate change may be something in a faraway place in the American imagination. But it is not for people and the communities in which I live. It is not. Okay, my, my um, nephew had to be extracted so I don't, I don't negotiate. Everyone can call me a climate alarmist. Come to Puerto Rico and I'm, I'll show you what is being an alarmist. 
And I, that, I, that line, I'm not gonna cross that line. That's super clear, huh? Very, very good, thank you very much, huh? Thank you very much for that. And next, I'm delighted to introduce Alex J. Jaime from Data Miner of Artificial Intelligence, Data, and the Future. You're up. Great, really great. Great. 